So today I'm presenting some research that I've working on, been working on for about three years now, um, first in the form of an undergraduate dissertation and then a master's dissertation. So this is sort of a very, very brief overview, so I'm sorry if it's just vague, but you can throw questions at me afterwards. So the museum sector has been, unsurprisingly, negatively affected by the most recent recession and subsequent public funding cuts. The extent to which museums have suffered has been assessed and this has been detailed by annual museums association cut surveys which have revealed that one in ten museums have considered selling parts of their collections, the numbers of school visits, free events and temporary exhibitions have decreased, many staff have been made redundant, opening hours shortens and many museums just closed altogether. Cut surveys have also revealed that museum staff are spending increasing amounts of time and energy concentrating on fundraising and income generation, as this graph here shows, and that they will continue to do so over coming years. These statistics are incredibly illuminating, but they tend to only focus on the tangible effects of recent funding cuts. Questions about intangible effects, such as if museums are desperate to generate income, how has this changed the relationship between museums and corporate funders? Has the balance of power shifted and are museums less objective as a result have remained unanswered? So the, these are the questions that this study attempted to answer. These are quite important questions that need to be answered, especially in light of recent media coverage of events such as Shell seeking to influence the content of the Atmosphere Gallery, which it sponsors at Science Museum. This is especially true of national museums, which this research focused on, because despite significant government funding cuts, the museum sector still receives a considerable amount of money from the taxpayer. The Department for Culture, Media and Sport spent £426 million on museums and galleries in the 2013-14 financial year. As publicly funded entities, museums are expected to be open and transparent about their work and their funding. However, this isn't always the case. Protest groups such as Liberate Tate have had to resort to court proceedings to force arts organisations such as Tate to declare the specifics of sponsorship agreements with organisations such as BP. A museum association investigation found that museums found that participants view museums as incredibly trustworthy and believe that they present balanced, accurate and incredibly sorry, balanced, accurate and objective facts on topics such as art science and history, for example, due to their educational purpose. The museum's audience, the general public, expect museums to provide objective information. As evidenced by public and media reaction to liberate Tate's court proceedings and a judge's declaration that the Tate had to declare the amount of sponsorship it received from BP, the general public and the taxpayer have the right to know how museums are funded. They deserve to know if ideals of objectivity have been compromised in the struggle to find funding, so they can view the information that museums provide accordingly. This is essential in view of museums in the United Kingdom receiving record high visitor numbers. Between August 2013 and August 2014, for example, the number of visitors to Department for Culture, Media and Sport sponsored museums and galleries rose by 10.5%, a huge increase over just 12 months. As this research asks whether museums are becoming less objective, it's important to clarify what I mean by objectivity. The dictionary definition of objective is not influenced by personal feelings or opinions. In comprehending what this means to the museum sector, it is imperative to recognise that the way in which the past is understood is important when considering how heritage can be displayed objectively and then consumed. Jordan Nova states that we understand the past not by spuriously re-experiencing it, but by turning over many different kinds of evidence relating to it, and by generating from this an understanding which inevitably has a strong intellectual, that is abstract, component. Consequently, in order for museums to fulfil their educational purpose in supporting the public's understanding and knowledge of the past, the public need to have access to or be able to turn over all of the evidence relating to an event, time or peoples and be allowed to generate their own understanding and come to their own conclusions. What is present in historical narratives, like that which is omitted, is not accidental, even if the selection processes are largely unconscious. It is precisely in this way that historical myths are constructed. 
For museums, objectivity means that museums and museum outputs should not be influenced by personal feelings, politics or beliefs of museum professionals. Events should be portrayed in context, considering their place in the world, with cultural ideologies, including nationalist undertones, absent. The narratives of all countries and all people should be recognised as equally important. Rather than being monovocal, outputs such as exhibitions, galleries and programmes should allow for a polyvocality, with representation being focused on all, no matter what their age, gender, class, ethnic background, religious persuasion or political allegiance. Only when a multiplicity of voices can be heard and different representations found, Corsain proposes, can museums be places where dialogue can take place, and only then, he suggests, can they challenge, inspire and act as resources for lifelong learning. Whitehead concurs with his qualitative longitudinal study of the Baltic Centre for Contemporary Art in Gateshead, with museums have a responsibility for ethical, polyvocal interpretation. Objectivity in the context of the museum requires them to transcend politics and personal beliefs, include evidence, objects and narratives which portray all views, truths or sides to a story, giving the individual all the facts and theories and allowing them to decide their opinion for themselves. This may never be possible. Museum employees are individuals like everyone else. They're made, their lives are shaped by their experiences and their views and thus they may never be able to completely remove personal biases from their work. Furthermore, museums are restricted by factors such as monetary constraint, lack of manpower, time and space. However, objectivity should be attempted, and where it's not been possible, made clear to the visitor to give the sense of transparency and maintain trust. This research was postmodern in approach, with a combination of methods, including a financial analysis, exhibition review, and interviews with individuals who currently or have recently worked in or with the museum sector, used to ascertain if museums have become less objective as a result of government funding cuts. To determine if the results of this study could be applied to national museums as a whole, two types of museum were studied, arts museums and science museums. For the purpose of this study, a science institution was defined as a museum that dedicated itself to collecting, researching and communicating, communicating the history of science. For example, the National Hi Natural History Museum collects and exhibits objects and items relating to natural science and the Museum of Science and Industry to industrial. An arts institution was defined as a museum that dedicated itself to collecting, researching and communicating the history of culture. For example, the V&A collects and exhibits items relating to art and design, while the British Museum collects and exhibits items relating to world culture. Annual reports and accounts from nine national museums, along with information gathered from freedom of information requests, were analysed to determine if division of income in these museums has shifted since the 2008 recession. Methods of income generation have remained the same since at least the 1980s, as highlighted by a comparison of current day annual reports and accounts and museum management books published in the 80s. However, this analysis showed that the division of income has changed since the 2008 recession and recent government, fu government funding cuts. Surprisingly, the amount, of museums, uh, the amount of money these museums received from corporate funding actually increased during the recession and has continued to do so. This was the case of both arts and science museums, although to a lesser extent for science museums, which is perhaps a result of their increased dependence upon scientific and research grants. In order to assess whether museums have become more reliant upon this income stream, and this income stream had therefore become more important, corporate funding as a percentage of total income was calculated. The figures demonstrated that corporate funding as a percentage total of income had also increased over this period for both arts and science museums. In order to ensure that these figures weren't simply the result of inflation, a comparison of how sponsorship and admission fees income changed year on year in comparison to inflation demonstrated that variations in corporate funding do not simply demonstrate inflation at work. 
To assess whether this change resulted in a lack of objectivity, eight temporary exhibitions, which corporations sponsor, allowing museums to make a profit on admission fees, were compared to internally funded permanent galleries at the British Museum and the Natural History Museum, which were chosen as case studies. Exhibitions were evaluated against permanent galleries to assess if the recession and increased corporate funding has resulted in a visible change in objectivity. Comparing corporately funded exhibitions against permanent galleries rather than ideals of objectivity separated any potential bias which may be inherent within the museum and that which is the result of corporate funding. Many differences were identified. The temporary ex exhibitions use more colour in their creation and presentation than the permanent galleries, creating a sense of atmosphere. Exhibitions told the visitor a clear story. Fewer objects were included, but more for each object was represented as having greater significance. Corporately funded temporary exhibitions included more technology and were better designed and laid out compared to the permanent galleries, with more thought given to the visitor's experience and managing footfall. There were differences between arts and science exhibitions, such as intended audience and interactivity. However, these differences were replicated in the permanent galleries and therefore not a result of differing levels of corporate funding. Corporately funded temporary exhibitions were different to permanent galleries in both science and arts museums. They were bigger and bolder. However, the temporary exhibitions analysed did not appear to be less objective than the permanent galleries. Historiographical, archaeological, environmental and political debates were avoided. Both the corporately funded temporary exhibitions and the permanent galleries embraced diversity and gave an inclusive summary of their subjects. The presence of such diversity and the wide variety of objects displayed in the exhibitions and permanent galleries showed an attempt to be objective and ensure as many narratives were told as possible. The lack of variance between the objectivity of arts and science exhibitions suggests that increased corporate funding does not and will not affect the objectivity of na national museums, regardless of the museum's topic, the amount of corporate funding received, or the extent to which an organisation relies upon corporate funding, as arts organisations receive more money and are more reliant upon it, but no less objective. Nevertheless, this does not mean that these differences are unimportant. The differences between corporately funded exhibitions and permanent galleries gave the visitor the impression that temporary exhibitions were more important to the museum and worth paying for, whilst the permanent galleries were not. For example, the abundance of technology suggested more money had been spent on exhibitions than on the galleries. The inclusion of clear narratives implied the exhibition topic had been more thoroughly researched than permanent galleries. The design of corporately funded exhibitions, including decoration and a clear layout, implied more attention was paid to the visitor experience and journey through the exhibition compared to the permanent galleries. This suggests two things. Firstly, in order to sustain existing corporate funding and create opportunities for increased corporate funding, museum professionals have to ensure that existing corporate sponsors are satisfied with the exhibition they're financed. If existing corporate funders are not satisfied, Museum professionals risk losing not only repeat sponsorship, but also failing to attract new funders. As one interviewee, a museum professional employed in a large arts organisation development department testified, people come to events hosted by other sponsors and will inquire about corporate sponsorship opportunities. And as a museum association fundraising guide state, philanthropists all seem to know each other. The idea that corporately sponsored exhibitions are more important to the permanent galleries substantiates the notion that museum employees are increasingly concerned with generating income and pleasing corporate sponsors. Secondly, this suggests corporate sponsors expect more than the standard display presented in permanent galleries. This is perhaps unsurprising. Sponsorship is a commercial arrangement. Businesses are buying something when they sponsor an organisation. And doing so costs the business a great deal of money, costs which must be justified to shareholders and or a board of directors. In order to justify the expense of sponsoring an exhibition to relevant stakeholders, businesses need to prove that they gain something from it, such as tax breaks or publicity or hosting or networking opportunities. To ensure repeat and new corporate sponsorship, museums need to produce an exhibition that's big and bold and pioneering, an exhibition which is featured in the press and talked about, an exhibition that other donors would be happy to sponsor. 
The underlying repercussion of this is that the more corporate funding museums pursue and obtain, the more they'll be required to adapt to the blockbuster tastes of its donors. If museums can only afford to produce exhibitions that corporations want to sponsor, then this in itself suggests a potential for a lack of objectivity, for not all tastes may be catered for or narratives included. However, interviews with 15 individuals who currently or have recently worked in or with the heritage sector suggest that this will not be the case. Individuals from both arts and science museum stated Science Museums, sorry, stated that recession and subsequent public funding cuts had negatively affected staff morale. Staff redundancies and pay freezes left staff feeling squeezed, that they had to do more to cover the work of staff made redundant for less money. The sector is notoriously underpaid and difficult to enter, suggesting that the vast majority of staff work in the sector for personal satisfaction, a desire to do so and a belief in the importance of the heritage sector rather than a simple desire to earn a large wage. Interviews suggested that museum employees taking pride in their work and their museum was the key reason behind a lack of change in both the visitors experience and objectivity despite funding cuts. Individuals who believe in the importance of the sector were unlikely to allow funders to dictate content. Whilst interviews with sponsorship consultants suggested that the balance of power between museums and corporate funders has possibly shifted to favour funders, they also suggested that museums are well versed in creating clear legal contracts which do not allow sponsors any editorial input to exhibitions. Interviews with museum employees and sponsorship consultants suggested that museum employees are also well versed in managing the desires of funders. Even government funding has come with strings attached in the form of key performance indicators in recent years. And as previously stated, museums have ex been accepting corporate sponsorship for many years. National museums and their employees have methods of dealing with funder demands and ensure that projects which they cannot find external funding for also come to fruition, albeit less frequently than interviewees would have liked. This study found that corporate funding has increased at both arts and science national museums in the UK since the 2008 recession and subsequent pu public funding cuts. It also showed that these museums are becoming more reliant upon this income stream, with it forming a higher percentage of total income, and that these increases are not simply the result of inflation. An exhibition review highlighted that corporate funding has not resulted in a lack of objectivity, but noted the many differences between corporately funded exhibitions and internally funded galleries may lead to a lack of objectivity in the future. Interviews with 15 individuals who currently or recently worked in or with the heritage sector show that museum professionals have methods for dealing with funded demands due to a long history of managing funding stipulations and strive to ensure topics which are not popular amongst corporate funders still receive attention. Ultimately, this study demonstrated that national museums in the UK are not less objective as a result of the 2008 funding crisis. Thank you.